Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Shimshak. And today our guest is super producer Michael Beinhorn. You know him from all the records he's done. Uh, records for, uh, for Hole, for, of course, uh, Super Unknown, for um, our very favorite band of the decade, Soundgarden, uh, Aerosmith, Social Distortion, Red Hot Chili Peppers, it goes on and on. Herbie Hancock, which he won a Grammy for. Uh, as a player, though, right? No. Oh, okay. okay. Co-wrote okay. and co-produced, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. We'll, we'll get into all that. I don't want to snip it out and put it up here in the front. You're, um, but uh, he's coming to us from uh, Colorado, and we are proud, and we'd love to have him here. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure. I want to remind everyone before we start to please hit, subs hit subscribe and uh, hit any notif notifications you may need if you're on Facebook or not Facebook, but uh, on YouTube, uh, hit the notifications and hit that little bell too. Uh, Michael Beinhorn is one of those guys, if you're coming out and you're in the music business, it's like he's just on another level. When I was in New York City, I can remember hearing stories about him, one of which I want him to tell us about his... Uh, is trying to get rid of a ground loop at um, Right Track Studios, which is a fabled one that I didn't believe until he told me. Uh, but, you know, he's just at another level, you know, and you, you can get successful eventually, but there's always that crew of guys that you just, you put up on a pedestal and you've been that for me. So thank you for being that for all of us. And, um, and being such a cool, approachable guy, he, uh, Michael volunteered his time and did a, an evening with, with my school, the Apprentice Academy. And, uh, and held, pulled no punches. He told those guys exactly what they needed to hear, uh, and, and they were better for it. So thank you, buddy, and welcome. My pleasure. So, um, you know, the biggest record, you know, everyone, it's so different because people listen to music, and some records are big for some people, not big for other. but I think uh, Super Unknown was a big record for everybody. That was like, when you did that record, it, did it change your life? You were all, all, already a huge success, but was that something that you just were not prepared for? Um, well, <laughs> it, I mean, it, it, yes and no kind of thing. Uh, it was, it, it, it's, I don't know. I mean, I was, it, it, yeah, it's completely transformational. There's no question about it, but it coming into that record, I just had a gut feeling that it was going to be something very special. Like it kind of, it had to be. And that was my job. Like my job was to try and do everything possible to help push it over the edge. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I, there, there was this really great anticipation on my part. And then I heard demos for the record and I was like, oh, <laughs> Uh, you know, because it was, I mean, th there were a bunch of really, there, there were, there was a lot of music on it. There was about 11 tracks. Um, and there were about three or four things on it that were good and wound up getting used. But the rest of it was just like, you know, I, I don't think we can make a record with this, guys. And that's, that was a tough conversation to have because I just met, I just met them. And here they were entrusting their baby to me. And I had to come back to them with that. But I realized that it wasn't going to be what everyone needed to have that conversation with them. Well, that's, uh, a, that's a skill in of its own because there's a lot of producers that are just like, uh, they're cheerleaders. And you are not afraid to have tough conversations about drummers, about songs, about what the record needs. So I love that about the creative process. When you're in a room with talented people, if they're willing to have the fight about the music, it's totally forgivable. If it turns into an ego thing, then everybody's fighting for ego and you can hate one another. But uh, I love that you were willing to have tough conversations about, hey, this, this record isn't ready, where most people would be like, I don't want to lose the gig. But you're willing well, to lose the gig. Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, I don't like confrontation at all. I think I probably like it less than most people. But there are certain things that I'm just not going to countenance. And if you've paid me to work on your project and to have that kind of responsibility, I, I, I have to do my job. 
And my job in a case like that, my ethics won't, won't, they, they won't permit me to slack. <laughs> it's, I think it's genetic. So, uh, you know, if that's, if I'm faced with the option of like, Hey, you know, I have to say something that might lose me a gig or, you know, just walk away and pretend everything's okay because I really want to work and I really want to make the money. I'm going to go with option A every time because that's, that's the way I'm wired. And honestly, I believe in this position you have, a, you have ethics, you know, and you have to kind of, you have to live by them. How do you do that? Uh, how do you tell Soundgarden that out of the 11 songs they sent you, nine of them were no good and you don't want to record them? Um, I, I had to explain the situation to them. I said that I felt very strongly that they didn't have enough material to do to make a full record, that we couldn't go into a recording studio with what they had. And I, I had to be firm about it, you know, just to, to say to them, look, we can't go into a recording studio with this, with the, with, unless the quality of material is up to the standard that you guys need. I mean, at least, I, I mean, they, they'd already set like several bars with their previous records. Let's not go beneath, below that bar. You know, let's, let's take a look at this. I mean, a lot of the music that was on there was a little bit more of jammy. It was kind of the aspect of Soundgarden that I'm personally not a fan of. You know, I felt that when they went off onto these kind of like jams, a lot, I, I know that a lot of people like that about them very much. But to me, because the material is, the stru to me, the structural elements of the material are more important. So I wasn't as interested in listening to them jam on a record. I'm like, if I want to see, hear that, I'll, I'll see them live. Like, I, I want to hear, I want to hear these guys' ability to be able to, to create like a great song structure, you know, or an idea that has parts that work together. I love, I love constructed music. I mean, jam music is great too, but I, I feel like once you've listened to that on a recording a bunch of times, it just sort of, it starts to get lackluster. Right. That's my experience with it anyhow. Whereas yep. if you're dealing with, like, I mean, I can listen to, you know, Bach, like, you know, music, the musical offering. Um, you can listen to that over and over. If, of course, if you, if you like Baroque music, you can listen to that over and over again. And it's so complex. And it's so amazing and intricate. The way, the, the fact that that came from one person, that he was able to use an ensemble of instruments to create that kind of mesh, it's, right. it's extraordinary because you're actually, you're, you're listening to a guy's brain work, but you're also hearing how they're able to evoke that and communicate that through a bunch of instruments. And to me, that's special. That's more special than listening to a record with a bunch of guys jamming. Well, and kudos to Soundgarden for being willing to hear that, right? Because that's going to be tough too. You show up with 11 things and your producer says, you know, respectfully, I disagree. And I don't think it's in the best interest of the brand and the music and what it is we were setting out to do. Uh, that's hard for them to do. And kudos to them for being able to say, okay, he fought for the music and, and he was compelling. Yeah, that's, that's very well put. Um, yeah. You know, I'm walking into a minefield just by presenting that to them. And they have right. every right to, ba to basically tell me, hey, you know what? We'll get someone else to do this record. You're fired. Absolutely. You know? They're they lined up. Do it. They didn't do it. I mean, they didn't, they didn't like hearing that at all. But like, you know, because obviously you, to a certain extent, that, is, that can be taken as an insult, even if it's not meant that way. But oh, it really speaks... It speaks. To, it does speak to their character mightily. Yeah. Yeah. In the, end, in the end, did they appreciate the craft and everything that went into it? As a, um, as a no. <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> That's a perfect response. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think there's any reason to pull any. No, they they didn't. Um, and it, it's it, it, it was honestly it's their record. It was their prerogative not to. Um. And I, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't take that away from them. <laughs> Their lack of appreciation, you know, also for how the record was made, because it, it was pretty painstaking. I bet. You know, but they, you know, they, they, they let it happen anyhow. And I think, and obviously the results spoke for themselves. They sure did. Now, didn't you tell me that you found Black Hole Sun on a cassette? It was at the end and you were mentioning like, what is up with this song? And they were like, oh, do you like that? Tell us the story of 
the Black Hole Sun. Was it on that 11 that they originally sent or? No, no. Actually, what was happening was that uh, Chris was sending uh, batches of demos to me. And he sent a batch of like 12 or 13 songs at one point, um, which I, I listened to them and I was like, oh, God. You know, they, they, I, I've heard them since. And it, it, they're not bad. I mean, I, I'd say by today's standards that you, I think they would stack up pretty well. But at that point in time, they were so off the mark. I mean, it wasn't the record that they needed to make at that point in time. I could just feel it in my bones. And I was like, I have to talk to this guy about this because he's, he's definitely, he's taking, he's swerving away from what this, what this has, what, what, what this feels like it should be. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, again, you're, you know, you're, wa you're, you're wading into very dangerous water, <laughs> you know, taking a position like that, not being, a, you know, a co-composer in this music. So I, I knew what I was getting myself into, but I was like, I, I didn't have time to kind of second guess the whole thing. So I, I called him and I was like, listen, you know, we got to talk about these demos. And what I really wanted to, I, I didn't want to get into like the, hey, you're not doing the right kind of music. These songs aren't hitting the mark. It was more like, what are you thinking about? What are these songs for? Like, who are you writing these songs for? What is this about? What is this record to you? Like, who's this, who are you trying to reach? And I started to realize, based on what he was telling me, that he was writing a record for Soundgarden fans. And I was like, oh, no, I, you know, like this record, like whatever you do, this has to be what, uh, that came from deep inside of you. And, you know, we talked about the kind of music that, that he was into. And, uh, excuse me, you know, I asked him point blank, what do you listen to? And he's like, the Beatles and Cream mainly. And I was like, okay. Write a song that sounds like the Beatles and Cream. Then. Oh, that does too. Uh, and a lot of yeah, you know, and he, you know, he, he was like, but what about, you know, what if, what if it doesn't sound like Soundgarden? I was like, don't worry about that. When you guys play the song together, you'll make it sound like Soundgarden yeah. because you are sound. You can't write music for people who you've never met, you know, who don't, whose shoes you haven't walked in, whose lives you haven't lived. Like just, you know, make music that feels like you, you know, do that. You're going to make, you'll make it great. And three weeks later, I get this cassette tape, you know, new demos. There's four songs on it. The first song was Fell on Black Days, which, I mean, if you know that record, you know that song. I, the, the minute I heard it, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's <laughs> it. And then the second song was a song um, called Anxious, which never got cut, but it had Jerry Cantrell in it. It was more bluesy. It was really. The third was a song called Tighter and Tighter, which I wanted to cut. And they wound up doing on Down on the Upside, uh, and which I, I, I loved. Uh, and the fourth song was Black Hole Sun. And I, I, you, you may remember when I was talking about this, I just I remember how I felt the minute, the, the, the very instant the first few notes came on. I was like, what in the holy hell is this? What am I listening to? Goosebumps just thinking about it right now. It just blew me away completely. What is the Leslie and, type guitar sound going on in there? I, it might be a Leslie. I don't know. Well, it's, it's kind of a Fender Leslie kind of co-branding thing. It's called, it's a, a Leslie or a Fender 16. Uh, I think it was, I think, Fender at one point sold it as a vibro box or vibro. I can't remember, but what it, it's not like a standard rotating speaker that sits on the top of a Leslie cabinet. Mm -hmm. It's actually a rotating speaker that sits inside a speaker enclosure and it goes around and around this way. So the cone, so there's a cone facing out, but there's some kind of weird port on the speaker itself. It's actually covered with fabric. There's a port that allows the sound to come out of one little part of it. And you can control it like the Leslie, but there's no actual amplifier in it. So you have to use a separate um, uh, guitar head to power it up. And there's a ton of vibrato in that tone. So it's, there's something more than spinning speakers, you know, in Doppler. It's bigger pitch deviation That's than it. that. Wow. That's it. That's, That's it. That's all it is. It's this little, it's like a little speaker traveling round and round inside this cabinet. 
Wow, because there's so much, so much pitch deviation to it. Stevie Ray Vaughan used to use these things as well, actually. Uh, it's a, I've never seen one before he brought it in, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that thing sounds incredible. Oh, wow. So, to, yeah. so, tell, so you, when you called him, he didn't have high expectations for that song, right? <laughs> it was more like, hey, oh, you like that? <laughs> like, wasn't that sort of the... Yeah. The next, like, I actually it wasn't the next day. I listened to, I, I, God, I think I've told this story so many times. You know, I, I just, I feel like a broken record. But, like, I, I literally played that song 15 times in a row. I could not stop listening to it. It was so good. It was making me, you know how, how a song just kind of, like, has such a visceral effect on you that you start having, you know, a really profound emotional response to it. And you kind of feel it in different places in your body. And you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had this like it, it was it was like taking psychedelics. You know, it was that it was that profound. And I called this guy up, and I was like, you, you're a goddamn genius. And he's like, what, what? I was like, that song, Black Hole Sun, the you know the song in the cassette. And he's like, oh, you like that? And I was like, like it, <laughs> like it, pal. We need to go into a studio immediately <laughs> and start recording. That's like. That's the song right there, and he was like, "Really?" <laughs> I was I was shocked by his by his reaction, even more shocked by how the rest of the band responded to it. Wow! Because they were pretty much the same way. They were kind of like, "Yeah, it's okay." I was like, oh, "Are we listening well, to the same song?" You had to call him after <laughs> re after the record was out and be like, "Hey, I told you so, right?" I mean, it was that was a smash smash hit. Um. Well. It, it was funny because I didn't, I didn't really have that kind of interaction with those guys. It was more the um, the product manager for the band came in at one point during the record, and he listened to a bunch of tracks, you know. And he got up afterwards and he was like, "Okay, thanks." And he walked out. And like, what was that? You know, I was like, he no reaction at all. I was sitting there thinking. My friend, I've just handed you probably the best <laughs> rock record that you're going to have anything to do with a couple of years. Like, and all you have to say is like, thanks. But after the record was out, about three or four months in, uh, he called me and the, the only thing out of his mouth was like, I'm so sorry. I was so wrong. <laughs> It's wild, man. Music's a weird beast like that. You know, some people, it's like not even in their time zone. And then in other people, it slays you. Like you listen to the demo of that and it gave you goosebumps and it's, you knew what to do with it. I think it's well, brilliant too that it's like, you've got this thing where it's like, you're not in the band and you recognize that, but you'll fight harder for the integrity of what it is, the vision that you have for the band. You'll be willing at multiple different places to lose your seat at the table because you believe in it. And there's this odd thing that makes people love you because of it, because you, you, took, a, you took sort of a risk for the record, for the cause. And if you were wrong, that's great. Maybe you're wrong. But at least you do everything that you do to a finite level that is everything you believed it should be. And that's, that's failing in the current music. You know, a lot of records get made where people just – they turn into gig mode with it. So I applaud you for doing yeah. that. It's a lot of respect Thanks. for you. Thanks. I appreciate that. And it's you always great lot, too. You do a lot of pre-production. I know you're a big fan of pre-production. Um, did you do a lot of pre-production for that record? Or did you just go into the studio and just work it out and do it? Um, I can say with all certainty that I have never and would never make a record where I go into a studio with an artist and work it out. I, you, in my mind, you can't have enough prep work. You know, we we're well past the point in our collective history where a guy can write a song on the spot, go into the studio and cut it in 15 minutes. And he's got like a record that winds up selling millions and people talk about it, you know, for decades to come like Muddy Waters or something yeah. like that. We don't have Muddy Waters now. I mean, that's not to say there aren't people who are the rough equivalent or, or, or have that kind of talent, but things just aren't set up that way. So the idea of returning to this sort of like quaint ethic of, or aesthetic, I should say, of how recordings used to be done, to me that is, it's just foolhardy. It, it makes no sense at all. And I also think 
there's there's a, a a danger with artists who get sucked into the romance of something like that, coupled with a record producer who really just wants to get a recording done as fast as possible, get paid and get out so he can get on to the next project. Yeah. So you've got both those things working in favor of, and plus there are no budgets anymore, as you guys know, to make records to start with, unless you're at the top of the heap, you know, um, and there's so few of those. Certainly there's no one in the, you know, in the realm of rock music that I can think of who can, who can afford to make a record like that now. Um, and uh, it's, it, it, to make a record without pre-production, I think is incredibly dangerous. And I've seen it happen so many times. You've got a, uh, a your whole website is based around pre-production services. I'm essentially, it's more about remote recording. It's, it's more about working remotely than anything else. But I will provide pre-production for people without getting involved directly in their production. That's how, that's how strongly I believe in it. And wow. yeah, I mean, because I, also because I don't have the same kind of, um, I guess, skin in the game, so to speak, as the person does who's like a boots on the ground record producer who's going into a you know, recording and is counting the amount of time, the amount of hours that they have to spend with an artist. I can take as much time as I want or as the, as the artist might require to get their songs right before they roll in. I mean, my objective in that case is to ensure that the artist has all their material in record ready shape. That yeah. they're complete, they can just roll into a recording studio and from that point do whatever it is they need to do and use the time in the studio to mess around getting sounds or experimenting with auxiliary parts and stuff like that and performances, things that you should be, all the stuff that you should be doing when you're in a recording studio. Right. And how does that work with a producer that is not you? So you pre-produce the record <laughs> and hand it off to a producer that then produces the record? Yeah. Yeah. You've got a lot of really, uh, probably some great ideas on what guitar parts should be there and foundational vibes of how it should come out of the speakers. Is that not like frustrating? No, not in the least. You're uh, not dude. I'm, You're a special dude. <laughs> well, like, you know, I, my, my family tell me that too. So, <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, and you listen to how meticulously the records you do are and the sounds that you get and what comes out of the speakers and you think to yourself, like, how can that guy, like, once you're done with pre-production, I couldn't imagine that you could be happy with the final result. It's so specific on the little things. Well, I've had to approach the whole process of recording from a different perspective. You know, to be able to spend the time to do that, to, have that, to wor work with that much detail, you need resources. You know, yeah. the records that you've listened to that I've worked on, where you're focusing on, on all those little details, it's not because someone was lucky enough to throw a mic up and was like, oh, there it is, and on to the next. Right. You know, that's people like fiddling around with stuff, a lot of fiddling. You right, know, to make it Oh, that truly. mic doesn't sound, yeah, just move the mic a fraction of an inch that way kind of thing. Yeah. And so on and so on. You know, to create a cumulative effect that that reflects and amplifies the scope of the music even more. But because we don't have the kind of resources to do that anymore, uh, it's virtually impossible. To Dude, that's do a heady music. thing to wrap your mind around. And it's like, it's really challenging for me, like watching you and hearing you talk about that and me thinking I couldn't do that. But it's like, it's the kind of conversations that I, when I have with folks, I'm like trying to imagine expanding into that kind of philosophy it's a it's a it's a heady thing to be able to well i only think records happen a couple of ways the way i do them but then a guy like you says something like that and i'm like well maybe i could what if i started thinking that way would i be capable of actually doing that and it's something that it's like it's an evolved state is what i'm saying well look there's there's a, there's a bunch of different ways of looking at music production you know, one of which is the functional aspect of it. And, you know, functional, not just in terms of like, I serve a, a certain function in a recording studio, the function of, I make money doing this. This is my job. I am a record producer, so to speak. You know, and 
those are the angles from which most people look at making records, you know, and then and the different types of music producers, you know, that I, that for example, I talk about in my book a little bit, you know, that there's some people who, who are, are, are good cheerleaders, some people who are good, you know, engineers, and excuse me, may not be as much up on song arrangement and things like that. Um, you know, but people f have to fit into a framework that exists now, unless mm. they don't, <laughs> unless they don't, because there's something else that exists. And this is, this is much harder for people to swallow, especially in this particular age where there's no money to make a record. There's no time to make a record. And who wants to be fiddling around all day, all week, all year, making their record anyway, because I have bills to pay, I got kids to feed, and blah, 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 blah. And life has got more serious things happening besides the world is falling apart and we've got COVID and, you know, there's psychopaths running the country and things like that. So, you know, all of a sudden you can, you can deprioritize the concept of what this essentially comes down to Music is a form of a communication. It's an art form. It's a way that we use to express ideas and feelings to, to other people. Yeah. You know, we speak through it. But people don't use it that way anymore because they don't see it that way because they've deprioritized it so much. It's not even devalue. I mean, I see people use the term devalue a lot, but it's more profound than that. It's deep, you know, it's, it's deprioritizing. It's making it less important. Uh, and as we, the creators, make it less important in our own lives, um, you know, and, and there are practical reasons why we don't, why we do that, we think, <laughs> you know, we make something that resonates less and less with other people. And that's where the disconnect happens. Dude, it's you interesting know? that you say as we deprioritize it, Right. It's the, yeah. that it's us. It's, we blame it always on the labels or what people want or social media, like what they'll allow us to do. But the reality is we're the ones, it's in our hands, and we've made a conscious decision to bend to that. Well, yeah, that, exactly. And that demonstrates a sense of resignation, you know, kind of like giving up, so to speak. Yeah, look. Anyone who takes that position isn't wrong. I would, I'm not going to say that anyone's wrong. People have reasons for doing things. No one's wrong as far as I'm concerned in anything. If that's how you feel, that's how you feel, you know. But we also have other things that go on inside of ourselves. We have an inner dialogue, <laughs> an inner life, you know, and there's such a thing called ethics. That's you know? it. See, it, it, people don't prioritize it at times, but it's when if you are a man of principle, your rink, your records will be principled records. You can't make a meaningful record without setting out to do it. Well, yeah, exactly. You can't like I I will take the stand that I take because I'm driven by a particular set of ethics, and so far nothing in my life has caused me to willfully set those ethics aside. Mm -hmm. um, whether that makes me right or makes me wrong is totally irrelevant. It feels right to me. It looks completely wrong to someone else. And yeah. that's fine. That's their position. That's how they feel about it. But I believe very strongly in being guided by ethics. Um, and letting that be sort of, I, I guess, kind of like that and, and whatever int intuition I might have, being the sole arbiters of any choices that I make at all. I don't think that, because when it gets right down to it, I don't, most of the choices that we make creatively aren't intellectual ones. We make them intellectual because we have higher logic and reasoning faculties. But really, these decisions are based on something that, that hits you the wrong way. You know, a musical decision where you have to change something or, or you're, playing with the sound, trying to get it to fit a certain way with other sounds, or just establishing a baseline for the sonic character of a recording that you're working on, it's all based on something emotion, something, something sensory that happens inside of you. That's what you're responding to. And what the mistake that's made often is converting that into an, into an, intellectual, under, an, an intellectual exercise 
in a way that, and, and finding an intellectual solution. I mean, you can intellectualize it. You can create a, a logical framework to be able to rationalize why you're doing what you're doing and using your understanding of equipment, which is also intellectual, to figure out a solution. If it's something where you're, if, if the solution is based in the equipment that you're using. But everything that we do is based on a sensory response to something that's happening in our environment. When you talk about principle, how many records have you gotten thrown off of for principle? Um, He's counting. <laughs> no, I'm trying to remember, actually. I don't think I've actually been, th- I think, I mean, I've walked off a couple. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. You would think uh, you don't do it because of, some people would not do it because of fear to lose the gig. But at the end of the day, I think people look at principal and they say, hey, that guy, he's going for something. We need to give him more leash to do that. You know, it's, it's worked out for you, obviously. Well, it's easier for me because at the times that I've, you know, that I've worked on records like those, you know, no one's going to argue with the kind of track record that I have behind me. And they can also refer back to other times where I've had to have similar conversations with people. Yeah. And I mean, I don't, I I think back when a lot of this stuff was, when some of these things were happening, I sort of relished the idea of being right per se. (laughs) That's not what this is about at all. I mean, and that was my, that was my utter misunderstanding. I was basically rolling with what I felt. I was going with what I felt. I was going with my intuition. My intuition speaks very, very loudly (laughs) to me. And, but the thing is, is that everyone has the same faculty if they choose to take advantage of it. It's just that we, as a, as a, as a civilization at this point, are being directed to, you know, to head in a different, toward a different place. And how you difficult know, that, that must be for you to be the guy that doesn't like con- controversy and, and, and um, arguments and then have to be the guy that continually does it. Right. I mean, you've already said it's the, the, one of your least favorite things, but then you'll have to go to the band and say, the drummer's not cutting it. We need to kick that person off the record. I mean, um, that's yeah. an impossible situation. How do you, do you prepare for that? Is it like you spend a couple of days getting your, you know, your spiel down or you just go in and, and in the moment say, Hey, this is not good enough. And we need to get you out of here and someone else in here. Um, in a lot of those cases, it's happened pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, because in the case of recording, like when I work with Hole, for example, like we had done so much prep work before we went into the studio to ensure against something like that. You know, I mean, it's funny. I, that's one of the, the, the ironies of that particular situation that, excuse me, before the, the, my involvement on that record was actually conditional because I already had developed a certain reputation for letting drummers go. And the band said to me, we really want to make this record with you, but you can't fire our drummer. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we won't fire your drummer. Was that you know? Celebrity, celebrity Skin? Yeah, it was. What a record, man. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but, you know, we, and because, because of, that was my directive, and I tend to follow directives to the letter, when, it, when an artist has provided me with them, I went to the drummer and I was like, you and me, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be like this, you know, we're going to be working together. We're going to get this right. You know, this is going to be, it's, we're going to be a team, you know? And she was like, okay, cool. And we spent about a month and a half in rehearsal, you know, writing drum parts. And, you know, I just rehearsed her a lot and she sounded good. You know, when we were in rehearsal, I mean, it wasn't the greatest drumming I'd ever heard, but it was, it was adequate and I felt that it would serve the record. And then when we went in, it all just kind of fell apart. And I had, I, we'd been in the studio for about three weeks or something like that, and it was actually getting worse. And I had to go to the band and talk to them about it. And they said, do you remember the conversation we had at the beginning of the record? And I was like, yeah, I do. And they were like, She's not going anywhere. <laughs> You're going to have to make this record with her regardless. And I was like, all right. <laughs> and then um, at one point during the process, 
um, you know, where we, we still weren't getting anywhere. And I think I was at the end of my tether. Um, one of the people in the band came in, was at the studio. And I was like, something's got to give here. You know, so I made sure when, the, when they came in that I was playing one of the tracks that I knew for sure was like just about the worst drum performance that I could find. Not that it was, I mean, it, I, I guess you could say that's a, that's a terribly manipulative thing to do. And in a way it was. Um, although I think at that point they were all pretty much on a par. And I remember um, them hearing this track and recoiling in horror going, like, oh my God, what is that? And I was like, it's your drummer. And they were like, fire! <laughs> Awkward. And they stormed out. Uh, what? was 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 it the nerves of being the red light in the you know being in the studio as opposed to the rehearsal room um because you said it was going pretty well during rehearsal i you know i've I, i'm not clear and i don't think i ever will be completely i think that there was some, i think that there was like an issue with some substances that one of the people in the band said this to me so i had to go on that um one of the things that was happening was that they were kind of going, the drummer was kind of going off kind of script, so to speak. Like we'd really made very, very tight roadmaps for this record because it wasn't meant to be kind of more of a jammy type rock record. It was like, they wanted to make a pop record. Like they wanted to do something that really went against everything that they'd done before. So that, you know, that was also part of the directive. And she just started throwing fills in wherever she felt like it and kind of, you know, th doing things that were going to walk, that were walking all over the structure of the song, as well as not playing the songs particularly well. And I think that, I think that there may have been some nerves involved as well. Although I've never seen it quite that profound. I mean, outwardly, she didn't act as if anything was wrong. You know, it was, in, in hindsight, it was really hard to say. Isn't it interesting that it's hard for you to say, uh, you're so like focused in laser precision on lyrics, on arrangements, on sounds, production. And even a guy that's so analytical like you still has to say, still has to give up the vote to the goosebumps. Still has to say, I don't know what it was totally that wasn't working, but it wasn't. It's so abstract against the very well, planned no, no, out no. production. You could, no, you could really hear that the performances were bad. It was very, very clear that they weren't, that they were, they were far from like, far from adequate. And they, they're just some of the worst drum performances I heard, which again was a real surprise to me because of the amount of time and energy that, that she put into like getting her performances right. Right. Um, it was something, it, it was certainly evident enough for the, her band member to hear, to walk into the room called, hear the drum performance and be like, whoa, that's yeah. bad. What was the single on that? Was it called Malibu? Uh, that was the second one. The first was Celebrity Skin. Oh, so that was the name of that song where you go into the chorus like 18 seconds in, right? ba da ba da ba da right? That's the riff. Oh, my goodness. That's one of those records. When it came on the radio for me, it was like, like my vision went out. Like I was just like, if I was driving, I would have wrecked because it was like I looked at the radio. That came out, the mix on that, the guitar tones, the song, the hook, the arrangement, the production. When it came on, you don't know anything about anything, but you know that that was one of the monster hits of the year. It coming from a totally unexpected source, Courtney Love, right? I mean, no one expected her punk rock band to do something that slick. That guitar tone was crazy. <laughs> do you remember I'm what you used to like it? One. Um, oh, I, I remember, I remember it well. Um, in fact, I have, I have the entire rig. Um, it was, uh, it's interesting because I, I'd start on that record. I started to get into, uh, processing guitar sounds and, uh, using, running them through synthesizers. And on that record, we, we actually, someone loaned me a uh, vintage uh, Watkins Dominator. I don't know if you're familiar with this amplifier. It's a wedge front, um, really like relatively tiny combo amp from like the early 60s, I think. Um, 
and it's a you know they're, they're vintage amps. I mean they're they're pretty they're pretty valuable. Like a like a, a mint one is going to be like five six thousand bucks. Yeah. Um, this one was absolutely tattered. It was beat to hell, and it was owned by Jakey Lee, who used to play with Ozzy. Mm. And he he just he he had not treated this amp well. But what he did do was he took the original speakers out and he replaced them with Marshall Vintage Thirties, I think. And I don't know what happened or what went, what was going on with this amp, but it, it was like the voice of God. It was kind of like this weird combination of the best AC30 you've ever heard right. with like the best sort of like um, JMP 50 watt or four or J, JTM 45 type Marshall. It was just so good. And it's tiny. It was tiny. But if you put like a mic up, to the you know, right on the speaker, it would sound like an amp that was much much bigger. Well, that just, blows me away that you're telling me that's a small amp. It's a oh, what it is sounded it? like it. Well, it's, I'm not done though. I'm not done. See this. <laughs> there's more to it. That, what I mic mean, that amp use? sounded amazing. Um, I'm pretty sure it was just a 57 and an oh. RCA BK5. Oh, hold it. I brought this up from the studio. There it is. I got one of these, and then you told me that you used it on all the Soundgarden records, and I was like, oh, snap. i got to start using this on every guitar. <laughs> it, Maybe I'll get that Bindhorn sound. It just goes well with, um, with, with a mic like a 57. Yeah, I love those things. Yeah, I had They're mine redone my by uh, Kane, Clarence Kane. Clarence Andy Kane. With original, uh, an original ribbon that was old stock, old new stock. So. He's but, the uh, guy. So you had a 57 and a BK5B on it? Pretty sure, yeah. But and That gain was we being made at the amp? What's that? That gain was being made at the amp, or is it a foot pedal? Some of it. Some of it. Okay, go. I'm some sorry. It. Go ahead. Good. Go no, it's okay. See, because I was splitting. I, I was going into a, into a splitter, not an AB splitter. Um, it was a... Um, it was this... It, it, was a, uh, it was actually a MIDI splitter, a ground control... Um, which actually had um, audio ports, audio audio outs on it, and for some reason the buffer stage in it didn't didn't load didn't load amps. You know how when you split from an AB from an AB switch, the signal will come back from the amplifier and it'll load the, it'll basically create a feedback loop and load the and load the circuit down in the in your amps, right? So. You end up with a sound that's not as good as just the you know just the guitar plugged into the single amp would be, even though you got both amps running. You know by all rights it should be better. So for some reason this splitter and I wish to God I could remember the actual configuration that because you had to you had to wire it a certain way, but it was it it was incredible. It didn't load anything down, so you were able to pretty much preserve the the signal as it was going through the splitter into the you know into the amp. So I was doing, I was splitting into three things. The second thing I split into was a Sans amp. Oh. <laughs> a Sans amp rack. Yeah. But the third thing I split into was a whole synth rig. And what that was, was an ARP 2600. Um, the gain, the, the preamp stage on an ARP 2600 is actually one of the best like stomp box type distortion things I've ever heard in my life. And if you patch straight into the preamp and then patch through to the output stage and then out of there, it sounds incredible. It sounds so good. It's a very musical, it's a very musical transistor distortion, which is not always easy to find. From there, I went into a surge modular system. Um, so I was processing the living daylights out of that guitar. So a lot of the... Um, a lot of the um, process, a lot of the, the um, heavy guitar sound on that record is processed like that, and I would do like subtle modifications on the. Uh, so the ARP wasn't a keyboard sound; you were using it for its input and output stage. That's it. it. Yeah, yeah. It's just wide open. And if the whole you were time. to go and ISO just the fifty-seven on that, how much of the spirit of that end guitar sound is just the fifty-seven or the BK five B right off of the front of that? Yeah, but watch just the 57? Well, let's say if you ISO just the 57 or the BK5B that was on the Watson, right? Watkins. You, okay, Watkins. If you just, just so ISO, you get it right in case you start going on eBay. 
<laughs> so if you ISO just those tracks on your originals, how much of that is the, what percentage of that is the final percentage of all your combinations? Well, it's tough to say because like we're bouncing down to a single track at that point. Oh, so you stored them live. You didn't keep them separate and then mix them during the mix, the three elements. No, you got what you got. Well, that's another great point here. We get, <laughs> we get files sent to us to mix that have a hundred and some tracks on it, eight kick drums and samples and snares and guitar direct lines and bass direct lines. And at a certain point, when are you going to produce a record? You're the producer, right? You got to make some decisions and put, commit that guitar sound to tape. How do you yeah, feel about that? I've, you know what? I've, I've done that myself. Um, where I've split things up into different, uh, you know, into different channels. I think it's a horrible way to work. Um, you're at the mercy of the mix engineer. You're at the mercy of the mix engineer. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I, I don't like working that Commit, way. Right. You know, that's, that's why they yeah, it's, it sucks. The only time that, that I, the, the times that I've, I've done that was essentially because I literally couldn't hear what I was doing in the control room that I was in, which is oh, one reason again, why I, I don't like, I, I don't like recording. <laughs> I don't like going into studios anymore because uh, I don't know what I'm, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm hearing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So real quick, the right track story. I was working at right track in the nineties on a session maybe the early 2000s, who knows? And my assistant told me that Michael Beinhorn <laughs> made Con Edison shut down part of the grid to Times Square. Tell me the level of truthfulness to this story, to find a ground loop. Um, I don't think that they would have shut the grid down. <laughs> so that's not I, true. I don't, I don't have that kind of juice. We did have Con Edison come out. Um, it was interesting. Um, recording some high gain guitars in one of their rooms. And we went out to dinner, we came back, we plugged the guitar in and it just had this horrible like, mm. and nothing had changed and we were scratching our heads. We swapped out cables, swapped out guitars, swapped out amp heads, swapped out speaker cabinets, everything, the works. We wound up going to other studios. We wound up, they, they built a Faraday cage <laughs> for us right. in the room. That was like a coffin for the guitarist to stand in. Meanwhile, downstairs, some guy just plugged his electric razor in down in the apartment underneath you, probably. I mean, it was worse than that. <laughs> um, we actually found out what it was. Uh, we, the day that Con Edison came, so the best part of that story the, you know, was that there was a, uh, a, uh, one of the, like a peep show thing a peep show theater that was right next to the studio and shared, it had like a shared like sort of uh, fire stairwell. So you could actually open the door, open the door on the right track side and open the door on the peep show side and actually look in and see what people were doing in the peep show. Um, so Con Ed came in and they basically they had to go through the whole building, which included going into the peep show. So they were kind of walking around with like meters and stuff like that. And I, I opened the door to watch and I was like, I was seeing, they would walk into like places where abusing themselves, watching girls and the guys were like running out. Like it was very funny. Um, <laughs> it's a, it is a great story. Did they, did they find it? What was it? Yeah, they did. They got in a truck <laughs> and this is, this is actually the funniest part. They got in a truck with a Telecaster in a little like one of those little, like a pig nose type amp, like a portable. And they went all, they drove all around the city search, searching for where this hum was coming from because it was all over the building and it was metering too. They went, they went everywhere. They drove up and down the city. They found one area, like about a half block where the hum kind of mysteriously vanished. We discovered that it was a TV or a radio transmitter on a building someplace that was just burning out. And yeah, so we couldn't do anything about it. Like the studio manager contacted the FCC and the FCC was like, you know, recording, like <laughs> I get, you know, I, I, I get more money from, you know, in, in 15 minutes from a lobbyist, you know, who walks in, you know, 
you know, for, gi giving me giving me money to you know for the for a, for a sponsor someplace that you make in your entire an entire year get out of my face <laughs> so that and, was the end of that and for those who don't know right track was one of the premier rooms in in new york city even back in the heyday of recording it was one of the finest examples of wrap around giant million dollar console rooms that if you went in there with your own tape, I remember they would charge you an uncorking fee. Meaning like if you brought your own tape and you didn't buy their tape at the $300 a reel or whatever they were selling it, they charged you 50 bucks to use your own tape in that room. So it was, yeah. a, it was pretty high on the, you were, if you were working at a right track consistently, you were doing pretty good. Uh, was that, was yeah. that one of your favorite rooms in town? It was. And it's funny because it wasn't even the best studio in the city. Um, oh, what was the best studio in the city? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I loved Right Track. Um, I, I did. I, I, I loved being there. Like the, as far as like a live room goes, it's not. They, it wasn't a place that I would have tracked drums or anything like that. But uh, it was a great place to do overdubs. Um, the rooms were good. Like the control room sounded good. And, uh, of course, they were one of the first places that had a J-Series. Um, at that point in time, I really liked J-Series. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, I think I would probably have gone back to, like, a G. <laughs> well, but I think that, that when they bought that console, they gave them, like, 48 1081s, too, didn't they? Um, so they I'm had this sure. SS, SSL made this oh maybe it was it must have been their neve room so they had a big neve elliptical one that when they shipped they also gave them like 48 rack mounted 1081s with it they did um, capricorn yeah uh yeah i'm thinking of another one like a vr they elliptical a vr, VR or in that place i don't think so i can't imagine why they would give an ssl give it with with the uh, because i thought that it was part of the buy deal to get the 1081s but but go but go ahead um what were we talking about i'm sorry I, I, I also recall if and I may I may have you mistaken, Michael, but my first trip ever to Right Track was a buddy of mine was the um, uh, worked the front desk, and he said, "You want to go down and see where Michael Beinhorn's working?" I was like, "Yes." So, <laughs> there was a if I recall, there was a concert size PA system set up. Is that is that accurate? Do I have my memory? Uh, I don't think we did that in Right Track. It was the downstairs room at right. It was a big room and it had a full PA set up. And I'm almost sure he linked it to you, but maybe I'm wrong. That's a problem uh, with these stories. They get sort of like telephoned around. And that would have been Power Station, I think. Hmm. Was Power Station your favorite live room? Uh, Power Station was the best live rooms. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't work at Hit Factory um, just because – just because the reputation they had, I think, because you know, every I think every studio had their kind of like extras that they would ta that they would tack on to the um, to the you know overall bill. But I think Right Track were the most notorious, and you know you'd see stuff on people would tell me about seeing stuff on bills for like toilet paper rolls and things like that, and, or for the know, monitors like, that are sitting on the console. We got we got billed for the NS10s, yeah, as, as if we had requested them, you know, yeah. Exactly. A rental. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, in hindsight, I think it was the two main places that I worked in New York where were um, Power Station and, uh, and, and, and Right Track. And any I mean, I didn't, I didn't do, I, I did, did most of my, I've done most of my work out in Los Angeles. Were there any crummy studios that were still like nice Neve rooms like Loho and all these Looking Glass or Sorcerer Sound? or Remember those studios that still had really good gear back in the era of yeah. a lot of studios? Were there any of those that you loved? Um, no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> were you tough like when you were coming in where people like, oh, God, here comes Michael Beinhorn. Make um, sure that everything is right. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but but it, it's a funny thing how like you never get to hear about that kind of stuff. Like people people won't tell you, hey, you know, you're kind of a jackass when it comes to like, 
you know, when it comes to picking studios and stuff like that, you can be a real ball buster. Well, it went yeah. to your legend in New York City. It's like I'd hear these stories about Michael Beinhorn shutting down the grid <laughs> to find <laughs> the ground loop, and I believe them. So, you know, some of that was true, but it's like those are the things that people were not willing to do. Regular producers and engineers weren't willing to do that. And I would argue that it made a difference. I think that your records, some of those records sonically and arrangement-wise and production-wise are – they still are killing it today. If you put that, any, if you put any of those three records that we've, or the two records we've been talking about, just in this, they would be hits today on radio. They would change because you know pop music changes as to who is at the top of the charts. It could be a, reassur- a resurgence of rock and roll. Yeah. I mean that those are yeah seminal all records. Would, yeah, all all I think all it would take well I, it would take a major sea change for that to happen at this point. But the but. music, if you're just talking about putting it on the radio and people having a summer and having Black Hole Sun dominate their summer, right? That's the kind of thing that yeah, man, it's well, good enough still to listen do that. to it, so I'm not complaining. How many records <laughs> did that sell? Uh, I think it's up around like 12 million now worldwide. Wow. That's nice. You know, you got to get some plaques up on those bare walls of yours. Look at you. You got a, you got a, what's that? You got a fan, one of those circle fans in the back, a couple of doors and blank walls. Uh, I put a couple up. You just don't see the other wall. (laughs) Yeah. That's where you keep all your, you keep, cause you could see it. It keeps your ego up. I don't go. Yeah. I, I don't go too crazy. I mean, I still have like all the plaques that I have are still like, they're still like album plaques, like vinyl. Yeah. You know, the, nowadays, they, they you get them with CDs on them, and they're more they're more like compact and, and right. stackable and things like that. You know, they look but, like YouTube awards. Yeah, I, I suppose so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are you working on anything that's really exciting you right now uh, in the record world? Um, well, essentially, the, the work that I'm doing now is primarily pre-production and remote production, and I'm doing that with a bunch of a bunch of different people. It's what I love about this is that it's completely removed from the music industry. <laughs> That's one thing that, that, that works. I mean, there's, I, I'm finding that when you work with artists at a certain strata, all of a sudden a lot of the, um, a lot of the things that you liked or that I liked about working on big budget records are kind of there again, because we don't have, we don't, we're not dealing with time with the same kind of time constraints because as I like to say that this, this is one of my favorite things to say to people. No one. One more time. <laughs> you glitched no out one's there. waiting. No one's waiting for your record. Uh-huh. No one is, no one's waiting for your next record, you know, which I, I think that you can take that as being highly insulting on the one hand. And on the other hand, you can take it as being like, okay. Liberating. Yeah, it's it, like the, about the most liberating thing in the world because you you don't have to um, you know there's there's no constraint on you. No one's looking down your shoulder, breathing down your neck. The only right. person who's putting pressure on it in this case is you. Yeah. You know, so if you remove that element from the creative process, all of a sudden, you're like, oh wow, I feel so much better. I can really create. I can really make the kind of record I want, and that means. Can you walk me through, let's say I was an artist and I hired you and went into pre-production with you. It would start off with listening to songs, talking about orchestrations. What, tell me what the process looks like. And at what point you say, bingo, you're ready to go in the studio. Um, well, what, what happens is, is that people present you with music first, you know, and I kind of, I, I'm going to vet it and see if it's something that I, that I, not, not just that I want to work on, but something that I feel I can really contribute to. I mean, this working like this really democratizes the process. So I, I don't need to be as, as picky and choosy as I used to be about the projects I did because I'm, I'm not operating. I'm not operating from the same place anymore. I'm not, it's not really produced by Michael Beinhorn. My function is totally different. I'm essentially, I'm for all practical intents and purposes. I'm more of a consultant now, but it's a creative consultant. So, it's something that's fulfilling to me. What I do is if I'm, produ- if I'm doing pre-production on a person's record, I just sit and listen to their music, make notes, ex- you know, make them as extensive as possible, re- send them back to the artist, 
and from there we talk about it. You know, they talk, we, we have a discussion, you know, the same as we're doing right now via Zoom or something like that. And we talk about how they need to be implemented. And that whole process goes back and forth three times. By the end of the third time, everything's usually in place enough where the artist is in a position to go and record what they've got, however they want to do it. You know, generally speaking, all people need is a light shined on what it is mm-hmm. that, they, that they have to look at. And it's always stuff that they either didn't think about before or something that was in the back of their mind and nagging away at them, but they just weren't sure about it or didn't understand why it was bothering. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a very educational and inspiring process for artists because they have an opportunity to look at what they're doing from a completely different perspective. It's like almost a la carte in our service. Um, more, more, more into the creative space, so maybe not, like because it's more about yeah. orchestration, songwriting, and product and arrangement. But it's kind of something that has been taken away from the normal structure of music business. It's a, you know, it is. Well, I guess it's like a. Uh, maybe it is more like pre-production in the sense that you're, you know, you're not just not making the record; they're going off and doing that some uh, some no. other way. Yeah, but I, I discovered that I don't need to make the record. That's the thing. Right. Like my function, see that what we've we've kind of bought into this idea that a record producer has to do X, Y, and Z. You know, depending of course on the kind the kind of music that you're doing and depending on the aesthetic of the producer. But it's it, it's not like that. I mean, the world has changed drastically. You know, we can modify how we work according to how the world is going we don't have to stick with these kind of burnished kind of i I guess you know tried and true in one on one level or decaying and kind of um dinosaur um paradigms you know for for record making we can we can evolve too you know and we can do things differently it's not as obvious as you would think talking to you it seems to me like that I have always seen a ball for being a ball. So I always assume in the future it will be a ball, but it's, <laughs> there is a, there is sort of a existential thing that you have to be able, and it makes a great record producer. You have to be able to look at the same thing differently continually to make records like you've made that aren't the first yeah. shelf of decisions. You know, these are, these are well thought out. Your vision comes from being able to see something uniquely that is very much the same with a lot of things. So it's an interesting talent. Of- there's a thanks. There's an element of critical thinking that goes into it as well that you have to rely on. That obviously speaks to the logical aspect of um, you know. I, I, actually, it's a combination of the logical and sort of like the this, the sensory aspect of uh, of working in an, in an art form. You know, if your senses, if your instincts are telling you the same thing consistently, you have to you have to alter your thinking. You know, if if what you're you can't seek confirmation bias, which frankly, I feel that I've been do, I was doing for years, and I think people who make, who produce records still are, but you can't you can't really do that anymore. Have you, you know, ever, I, that's not true. You can, but it's it it doesn't it's not going to lead anywhere constructive. You're so creative and so analytical. It's it's very rare to find that in one person that is like able to be a true artist, a hundred percent but then be able to look at it and deduce all that, you know, decide what is possible. What is, you know, the vision for something. Those are usually two different dudes, right? Um, I guess. Not with you. Yeah. Not yeah. with you. I guess. Well, there's a lot more to life than making records, you know? I mean, <laughs> you can, there is. Let, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I know, <laughs> but you know, I, I think that, that, that music production can serve you as a microcosm of, of what the, of what the entire picture is, yeah. you know, and how you kind of treat that process can be an extrapolation. And in my, in my instance, I feel it has to be of, of how one lives their life in general. You know, yeah. I mean, why, if I'm doing something and I don't see it merely as an occupational thing, but more as a, as a, as a situational existential um, and, and an extension of an expression of who I am. Why would I, why would I cheap it? I guess cheapen that and turn it into like 
you know, simply a matter of paying bills, simply a, a matter of functionality in my life. Yeah, that's cool, dude. Well, it's been an inspiration talking to you. Where can people find you? Is it michaelbeinhorn.com? michaelbeinhorn.com. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'm putting together a new website right now, um, which is still in, just still kind of uh, in, in, in foundational Is Facebook uh, or Instagram stage. a thing for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, if, if people contact me through Facebook, uh, I'll ask them to, ch- to touch base through my website so we can make it more okay. official. Um, yeah. But yeah. And uh, I don't, we didn't even talk about your book, uh, but you've got a book out that's a very cool book. That's how I met you. Tommy Hayes, a good, good dude. I love Tommy Hayes. That's Introduced right, yeah. the two of us. So big shout yeah. out to Tommy. Thank you for that, buddy. Uh, it's been a real inspirational, man, inspirational uh, activity talking to you. Both times Thank we've you. talked, it really makes me want to rethink some of my presuppositions, which is, that's a pretty strong day when you could talk to somebody and you're like, you know what, I'm going to try to see that a little differently, start thinking a little bit differently. That's the, in such a polarized political world and social world, when someone can truly talk to someone and have the idea that they need to maybe adjust the way they're living their life, that's saying something. And you've done that for me, bud. So I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. I so, like every, uh, every artist I'm working with, I want them to listen to this. There's some real gems in here that uh, we're, we're a good reminder of like, you know, writing from the heart. Don't try to write for your audience. That stuff is huge, man. And people yeah. forget it all the time. Yeah. They, well, it's, they don't forget it. It's, it's actually outside. It, and it's so strange to say this. It's really outside of their purview because no one's ever said that to them and they have no, nothing to exemplify that. You know, I mean, yeah. by, the best that people can do these days is, is to like say, Hey, go, you know, go listen to Led Zeppelin four or something like that, or go listen to exile on main street, you know, I mean, which, they're, which are, they're great records, but it's kind of like, okay. And now what, <laughs> you know, like, because to, to some people that would be like an immediate connection to something that you don't already know, but to other people will be like, okay, so what, what is that supposed to mean to me? You know, when, when what you're trying to evoke to someone is this idea of how do we speak to people? How do we emote? How do we, you know, how, how do we create the context for them that we want, that we want an audience, that we want a larger group of people to get into. And if they're not hip to that, if they don't, if they don't have an innate understanding of what that is, because, and, and no one's ever talked about this because the understanding always was innate. It's just not there anymore. It's not present in the creative process. So how can people know it? You know, the only way that they can know it is if you bring it to their attention, like, Hey, it's about this. It's about that. You know, if you have, a, if you feel something, you don't just, you don't just intellectualize. It's not just up here. You actually feel it in your body, you know, to be able to present those ideas to people. That's, you know, that's when their minds get blown and they're like, Oh shit. Wow. Okay, that, cool. That's next level. Yeah. Well, it's next level. So, I mean, well, and that's, here's the, that's the job. Here's the best compliment I think I can pay you is that if someone said, Hey, I'm working on a project. I want to work on it with you. And I'm working with Michael Beinhorn. Like that is the idea that you could be in the room with somebody that you respect and you think you're going to do some stuff that maybe you haven't seen before or think some thoughts or have a philosophy of the record you're going to be working on. That was something like, man, that's something that I haven't, I haven't even experienced. This is the kind of compliment I would want paid to myself is that people would be excited to be in a creative endeavor with you. So, uh, thanks. You're a good dude, man. Uh, look forward to (laughs) seeing what, seeing whatever you do. I mean, it's just, you're just waiting on the next great thing. So, um, we'll, we'll have your website, your socials and a link to your book down in the description. Go check it out. Um, Thanks so much uh, for a great day. And from the West Barn, we're signing off.